Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, we will be speaking with Professor Felix Padel. Felix is currently a research associate in the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex. He was previously a professor of rural management at the Indian Institute of Health Management Research and has lectured and taught at Jawaharlal Nehru University, as well as other institutions in India and elsewhere. He is the author of a number of books, including Sacrificing People, Invasions of a Tribal Landscape, and Ecology Economy, Quest for a Socially Informed Connection. Felix, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me for this. It's our pleasure, really. Uh, first, I'd like to tell, uh, I'd like to ask if you could tell us a bit about your background and experience with education in India and how you came to focus on this topic. Thanks so much. Yes. Um, basically, I did part of my education in India in between degrees in a British university, I went to India and did an MPhil in sociology in Delhi University, which was both for me an initiation into Indian society, really, so that a lot of my classmates, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still very close friends with them, and also an initiation into teaching from India, which, which has a kind of depth. And I guess many Indian students come to the West for higher education. I'm an example of the opposite. I actually went from Britain to India to, for higher education and and you know it it gave me a great wealth of kind of um understanding to do that it, and and brilliant teachers there so i i wanted to start by also mentioning odjalan has been a kind of basis for me and his last book sociology of freedom well that's the topic i i studied in india sociology and a kind of sociology that is questioning western assumptions um and the topic of education, I also um, really got so much from Ojalan's own description of his, um, his experience of schooling in Turkey, where, you know, salute to the flag and to the Turkish identity, something very similar happens in India that we'll be talking about. So what also I, I got in that first initial um, year in India was going beyond that. Delhi University is a vast campus and very amazing university, but I had people who really guided me towards um, tribal India and who the tribal people are is a massive question. So this is a book by an Adivasi or tribal friend. Adivasis means the first dwellers. So they have this concept of being the indigenous people of India. <clears throat> and this is a kind of polemical title, Whose Country Is It Anyway? Untold Stories of the Indigenous Peoples of India. And there you see you're looking over the shoulder of an armed policeman in khaki. And we'll talk about, you know, there's a lot of human rights abuses by Indian armed forces, as, as in Turkey, um, and so on. So that identity... Um, I began to make a transition to, to seeing things from, from their point of view then. And then when I came to do a PhD, which was, um, it was technically from Oxford University, but my actual teachers, you could say, were in Delhi University. I did a kind of reverse anthropology of looking at the colonial history of one tribe in India, in the state of Orissa, and a tribe called the Khans. And then from their point of view, studied the history of the British administration, the soldiers, the administrators, the police, the forest guards, the missionaries who oversaw the school and hospitals and were actually delegated by the, by the government to, to, as it were, civilize the tribes by educating an elite mm. of them. And then the role of anthropologists who came to kind of officially give a what was then considered a scientific definition of who they were, which of course took away the people's self-determination, self-identity to impose a kind of colonial evolutionist um, 
primitivizing, objectivizing definition of who the people are. So this is my, my PhD became a book that has been quite influential. And what the cover shows is two members of the Con tribe who are called the Dongriacons, and they're looking at the camera. And one of them, while giving her, her son a drink, is very subtly shielding his face from the camera. Mm. You know, the camera is another intrusion into the space of these people. So, um, and, and they were also a, a, a people who were considered that they had this um, ritual of human sacrifice. So um, the British suppressed human sacrifice or tried to, but in doing so, they, they burnt villages, they got sucked into setting one people against another people. And in some sense, the, the form of administration set up, which was first called pacification, was in many ways much more violent than human sacrifice. So, mm -hmm. and of course it took away, it gave to the state the, the monopoly on taking human life. So that's, in, in this book then, there's a chapter on the missionaries and the kind of education, they started by educating orphans and then what you could call, they created a kind of tribal elite. So that was what was happening. So that gives a kind of, background of where I'm coming from, that I had some of my education in India, but I began to look at the um, canonial situation. And then um, later, when I, I, I wrote this book with a, an activist called Samarendra Das, who opened my mind to the situation of mining in India. And then later I... Um, I, I've written several articles within the last five years on the issue of tribal education with a co-author called Malvika Gupta. And she's she was a student when I met her of a professor called Krishna Kumar, who is really one of the most free thinking educators in India. And he was director of something called the um, National Council for Educational Research and Training. And he oversaw an amazing um, reform of the curriculum in all Indian schools. And he did, he commissioned special studies into the situation of tribal people, of Dalits, of women, of environmental issues, of labor issues. And um, now under the present government, a lot of those reforms are being undone, unfortunately. But um, he really encouraged Malvika to look at the the policy in, in India that there has been towards tribal education. So in a way, what I say here is very much drawing from her work. She's in Ecuador at the moment, and maybe a later talk can focus on the amazing things she's discovering there. So that's very, um, it's, it's quite a complex subject. And also speaking now towards the Kurdish situation, there are amazing parallels between the education and self-determination situation in India and Kurdistan, but there's also a lot of differences. So explaining the Indian, the, the specifics of the Indian situation is quite, quite, quite a, a vast subject. Mm, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and so, so I'd like to move from here to talk a bit about the, the history of, of education in India, first beginning with the tradition of education in the region over its longer history prior to European colonization. Can you tell us a bit about that? So prior to um, British rule in India, um, villages were like radically self-governing in, in the mm. sense of there was nobody coming to give them education. Education was what they gave to themselves. And mm. they developed a system where older children were delegated to to teach younger children. And in, in this tribal society, an adult never tells a child what to do or what not to do. Completely different from what we're used to. Um, from the age of five or six or seven or eight, children go to live in what we call in English a youth dormitory, but they call it, or the, at least a tribe called the, the Gons call it the Gotul. And a Gotul is like, there's one, hut for girls and another in a different part of the village for boys. And they, the older girls would train the younger ones in all the 
so many different skills and like a boy every boy would grow up learning how to make a house how to hunt how to make lots of different kinds of food grow food make food dances lots and lots of dancing and then at set times the boys and girls would come together and a very romantic tradition lots of romantic poetry and falling in love and it's a culture where actually it was part of the culture to have um love affairs before marriage very very mm. different from again what were we're used to so it it's a, was a kind of education that was really in the people's hands where it was non-literate there was no writing then this these are oral cultures where people are proud of how much they they know by and they relate directly instead of through the intermediary of a book or a computer um and a lot of the knowledge is related to the land where they live so they learn every child knows hundreds of kinds of plants and animals and where water where you get water where um you know the whole environment is they, they don't even have a word for nature but it's mm. it's so much part of um the religion or the, the the spiritual life as well as the the dancing and dancing on the earth and all of that mm. so that's the indigenous form of education and then what happened with i talked about missionaries christian missionaries started um schools and then in modern in india every child is supposed to go to school or th there's a huge race for different areas to um raise the level of literacy so in that promotion of literacy of course it's very important but the oral traditions tend to get neglected and especially the skills of the hand the link with nature is often forgotten and what's real comes to be what's printed in a book even if it's quite a a dumbed down version of anything really um so yes that's in, in a lot of the tribal villages, there may still not be a functioning school. So even now, there's more and more boarding schools. So boarding schools mean taking children completely away from their families. So education is a is become a very complex and divisive matter in in tribal India. Hmm. And following on from this, uh, we can talk about. Uh, the impact of British colonization or the impact that colonial rule had on education. Right, yes. So when I mentioned Krishna Kumar, this professor of educational studies who's now retired in his 80s, so he wrote a very influential book called The Politics of Education in Colonial India, mm. where he studied British impacts on education in India as a whole. So one thing the British did was they introduced English language for the elite and they made English the language of India's elite, which is now considered quite a controversial thing. People debate endlessly, should they be using English or Hindi or another language? Um, so one of that stems from a very famous minute, as it was called, a minute meaning a, a record written by somebody called Macaulay who was very influential in the 1830s where he said um, just one bookshelf of English literature is worth everything ever written in, in the Indian languages so he really devalued mm. India's amazing literature and in a way it was very conscious that English was being taught to the elite of India so that they would be, interpret the government's wishes and ideology we would now say um so that happened in india as a whole and then within that the christian missionaries were delegated to to create a tribal elite really again to interpret the government's wishes hierarchically through the elites that was the british the way the british saw it anyway um and in the process of that they would literally delegate, okay, Roman Catholics there, Protestants there, Lutherans this area, Baptists this area, and all the missionary sites would be making applications. So with the tribe that I looked at, the cons, different sections of them from the 19th century were under the Roman Catholics, under the Danish Lutherans, 
under Spanish or Italian Roman Catholics and um, then under American and British Baptists. Um, so th this, in a way, the sectarian divides were brought because anyway, when you begin to convert children into a different religion, the village is divided and they no longer do the, the nature festivals together. And then when you've got Protestants versus Catholics, that whole split was exported there. So um, in the process of that, then what happened at, even before independence, Gandhi was really at the forefront of questioning this colonial education. So he would question the use of English, but especially he considered every child should be taught in their mother tongue. And he considered that schools should have a unity of hands, mind and heart. Mm. So, um, you know, ju not just the, the kind of separation of thinking that we're used to in the Western knowledge system. Um, but, and that, that's in a way Gandhi's impulse in education is something still very relevant today, but it was applied to tribal people by somebody called A.V. Tucker that he delegated to do that, who started something called ashram schools. And these were meant to give this kind of education, but in practice, um, they, the teachers did not learn the tribal languages and they considered the tribal agriculture very primitive. So in practice, Takar Bapa, Takar Father, as he's called, he, he promoted the policy of assimilation, mm. which, while at the same time, you've got a very influential sociologist, sometimes called the father of Indian sociology, who actually studied anthropology at Cambridge University in the 1920s. And he wrote a very influential book called The Aboriginal So-Called and Their Development, where he basically calls tribal people backward Hindus. Mm. So this just gives a blueprint for what later happened that out of these ashram schools, you've got what we call Hindutva, Hindu nationalism, that then trains children to be Hindus. Okay, you're very primitive Hindus. You have to worship Ganesh or Sarasvati like this. And so it teaches Sanskrit and never the tribal language. So India has, um, so, so yeah, but I mean, under, under the, um, under the colonial rule, you have this huge tension against what the British model of missionary led education, and you've got a Hindu backlash. Hmm. So that's what was beginning to happen already before independence. Hmm. And then transitioning from here to uh, education following Indian independence. And what, uh, if you could say a bit about what Indian state policy on education was like and how it uh, may have changed in recent years. So, I mean, this is such an interesting topic because yeah. the first educational reports, which were um, chaired by somebody called Very Elwin, who came as a missionary, became a Gandhian, and then became the first foreigner to get Indian nationality. And he became Nehru's advisor on tribal affairs. So he helped, he and Nehru formed the policy. And on the surface, the policy was wonderful. It was that every tribe was supposed to develop according to its own genius and not have anything imposed on it. Um, mm. And Elwin chaired the first educational committee report and he was part of the second one. And that was during the early 1960s. And they, they were really saying like the... Um, school and the teaching of literacy should not consider the gotul or the traditional education like enemies and every every state should try to develop textbooks in the tribal languages so that the tribals don't have to just conform to the state language and tribal school opening times should be locally adapted to when the important tribal festivals are and seasons of work in the fields because actually for children in that traditional society, they learn by working alongside the, the brothers and cousins and uncles and aunts and mother and father in the field and in the kitchen. So 
um, that season of working in the fields is very important. So, but what later happened was the school times were any child who didn't come to school because they were working in the in the fields, then it was considered that the parents, they're very illiterate, they don't understand the importance of education, they're trying to make the children work, that's child labour, yeah. and it's very bad. So the sensitivity of the early understandings and policies were, was not followed through. But then there was a fault in Nehru himself, because Nehru said these lovely words about tribes should develop according to their own genius, but in practice, he was building the first big dams in India and the first steel and aluminium factories, which caused mass displacement. So he and even Elwin never, never talked about that. So in fact, the imposed industrialization. And if you consider dams as the temples of modern India, it's like a a kind of religion that is based on industrialization, in, in fact. So he started that process. And then in the mid 60s, the first big education commission of India was chaired by somebody called Kotari, who was a socialist, like Nehru, no, he considered himself a socialist. He wanted to equalize education. But in the process, he was trying to work alongside the industrialization, which involved involved mining the remote areas of India. Um, so he was trying to promote more and more boarding schools and hostels and a redefinition of work that would bring tribal people into the modern economy. So that's happening. And you've got both this industrialization gradually imposed more and more on tribal children, but also Hindutva. So you've also got these um, tribal schools where you've got this organization that you could say was ultimately responsible for the killing of the shooting of Gandhi, um, which is Hindutva, Hindu nationalism. And you've now got 60,000 RSS schools. RSS is the force behind the present government. I mean, Rashtra Seva Sang, which means like the, the party of service to the nation. So it's ult an ultimately nationalist party, but a Hindu and very and very simplifying of Hinduism. Mm. So, but very anti-Christian and anti-Muslim. So in 2002, in Gujarat, you've got the worst ever kind of programs or, or massacres of Muslims in recent times. And you have tribal people bust in from remote areas to do some of the killing because they've been brainwashed in the schools to this Hindu nationalism. And then in Orissa in 2008, you've got what's called the Kandbahar killings. And that is in the Kond area, the area of the tribe that I looked at, you've got, um, again, the RSS or VHP influence of Hindu nationalism killing Christians in this case. So that's just two examples that really focus the danger of this. And there's many sociologists like, for example, Nandini Sunda and Delhi University has written books and articles really on, on this topic. Yeah. So um, just moving on from there, the most recent period is from the 1990s, you've got a new liberal policy where under the influence of the World Bank and IMF, mm -hmm. India is opening up to more international funding of mining companies. And then you've got more a situation like Latin America, where you've got real extractivism. So as part of this, you've got mining companies beginning to fund or set up their own schools. And of course, this is mining companies that are trying to get the land or the, the traditional common land of the tribal people. And at the same time, they're overseeing the children's education. So, of course, they are brainwashing in the children, if, if you like, into a kind of industrial mentality where industrialization is something to aspire towards and as part of that um with Malvika we wrote a series of articles about about this phenomenon of boarding more and more boarding schools for tribal children and more and more funding by the mining companies so you've got this entity called KISS and that's a photo of it I don't know if you can see it where 
Mm. You've got the world's biggest boarding school in Orissa called the Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences, where you've got 27,000 tribal children in one campus. Um, and you can see in that photo and many other photos, if you go to the website, you can see it too, the immense uniformity, like every child is having their hair cut short on enrollment and they've actually got UN funding for multilingual education. So they do have tribal languages there, but those who've really have been inside the school, say in, in practice, they're taught the mainstream, the state language. Um, so this article was published um, earlier this year when um, the World Anthropology Congress is, some, is a worldwide anthropology congress that happens every five years. And the one in January 20, 2023 was scheduled to happen in, in KISS. And there was a, a big protest about that and a petition that it should be changed, really trying to speak to many anthropologists. You can't have an anthropology congress in a massive boarding school like this. It's not... It's, it destroys the whole essence of anthropology, which is looking at really um, the diversity of, of human beings. And mm. so that petition succeeded. It actually, um, uh, the World Anthropology Congress was cancelled from happening in KISS. Um, but at the same time, there was, and, and that's when, when our article came out. So this op topic was really opened up last year. And this is just to show a bit like, how colonial anthropology is in India now, that this is a museum in Orissa, in the state capital of Orissa, showing the Dongri Khans, again, the people you saw in my photo, and the people who have actually su successfully resisted a big aluminium project and mm. involving bauxite mining on their land. And here you see them really primitivized and objectified. So, this is life-size human models of them. And then you go to that computer in the middle, you press a button and, and you get all the knowledge about them. So it really encapsulates how the knowledge about tribal people is working alongside this education because this is in a museum run by anthropologists who are very closely linked with, with KISS. So the role of anthropology is very colonial still in India. In some, in some senses, of course, there's lots of good anthropology too, but... Mm. Absolutely. So that shows a bit of the complexity of what mm -hmm. we're talking about. Sure. But to, to stick with this topic of boarding schools, in, in these articles you've written together with Malvika, you, you characterize the, the role of, these, uh, of the assimilation of these boarding schools as perpetuating a kind of cultural genocide against the Adivasis. I was wondering if you could just briefly elaborate a bit about that? Yes. So the... Obviously, the displacement of hundreds of thousands of tribal people from their homelands by big dams and mines and factories has caused a, 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 a huge level of cultural genocide because once people are removed from their land mm -hmm. and they're resettled in little concrete colonies um, and they have to get jobs where they can at first building the dam and then in the factory or in the mine, and then they probably migrate for labor to the cities or something like that. And you've got, in, in, in the name of development, you've got a massive impoverization. And like you hear those people who've been displaced say, no, no, nowadays we, we can't dance. We, we have got nothing to dance about. Mm. Literally often the old people die soon after they're moved there. And then the children, they might be sent to a boarding school like KISS a long way away. And of course, then they learn nothing about their culture because the link with the land has been broken. So the, the school is, is carrying on in a way from where the, it's, it's an extension of the displacement. And this is why also you get what we call cultural racism in the school. Not racism so much about the colour of the skin, although that may be an element, but racism about your culture. So children are mocked for speaking their language. Uh, a boy, if he has long hair, which is the tradition in the, in the traditional culture, he'd be just laughed silly. So boys stop 
speaking their languages, they stop eating their traditional foods, and they they try and do well at education so that they can get a job. And that this is why the culture, it's also what some people call linguistic genocide. Mm. So it's happening very fast. And that I mean, in a way, there needs to be a revolution in questioning this kind of boarding school mentality, as there has been in, in other indigenous cultures. But it's quite painful to witness in a way. Mm, absolutely. I, I mean, to give an example of that too, when we published this article, um, not having read it or anything, but part of the same um, tribal people petition not to allow the World Anthropology Congress to happen in KISS, one Adivasi woman, who I don't personally know anything about, her name is Santoshi Markham, she wrote an excellent article in English or translated into English that you can get online called um, How I Undid My Hinduization. Mm -hmm. So she goes into how the school she went to, she was taught Sanskrit, but never her own language, which would be Gandhi. Gandhi is a language arguably as every bit as indigenous and every bit as ancient as Sanskrit, but it's an oral tradition. So the la la language absolutely not allowed in her school. Well, in KISS or that school she went to, they all have to say prayers in Sanskrit all the time. Sanskrit's a lovely language, but when you have it imposed, it's very similar for Kurdish people, mm -hmm. obviously how Turkish has been Im imposed instead, or Arabic in, in Syria and Iraq, instead of the Kurdish very rich language. So that's a little bit about the cultural genocide and how that relates mm -hmm. to the Kurdish issue. And, and to transition from this last point, uh, as you have mentioned, as we've been speaking about, there are uh, strong parallels in certain ways with a number of other cases around the world, both uh, other indigenous peoples that have been colonized by the British or by other powers like in North America or Australia, as well as with the Kurdish people, which you have mentioned. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about these parallels and, and why you think we observe these parallels or the underlying forces responsible for these commonalities. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. It's, I guess, the as, as the nation state has become stronger since the 19th century, it really tries to promote itself through education. And even when it's not state education, like the KISS and everything, the mining schools are private schools, but the policy now in India is to promote a pro privatization of education, mm -hmm. knowing that that Hindutva or that Hindu nationalism is going to be intrinsic to that anyway. So, for example, in Canada, one of the kind of cases where they, they really, the prime ministers in succession have apologized for the boarding schools and for the policy of imposed um, assimilation. So all the schools were closed and now um, a lot of the tribes or nations, as they call themselves in, in Canada, they use their own language for education. But there was such abuse in those schools. I mean, where you have boarding schools, you also have sexual abuse. And mm -hmm. I mean, the amount of sexual abuse that's now known to have happened in the Canadian boarding schools and the boarding schools in the United States, it's mind blowing. Like in, it was almost institutionalized. And of course the sexual abuse went alongside corporal punishment, the forbidding of the tribal languages, forbidding of tribal religion, um, cutting short of the hair on entry, and also the giving of, of Christian names. In, in Canada, it would always be a Christian name. So you are not allowed to keep your tribal name. And it's the same for Adivasis in India that, um, all these things happen on enrollment and again and again, like the early missionary schools gave Christian names, but now it's Hindu names. So very often like standard Hindi, Hindu names are given instead of a tribal name. But this is one good reference point for me, an indigenous history of the United States where you see the whole history we may know of the United States from mm -hmm. the point of indigenous peoples. And then you see what the United States has imposed on the world in terms of, this is a book about the Hmong who are indigenous people of Laos and Vietnam on the border area. 
the CIA used them against the Viet Cong. So, um, you know, com communist governments like then, of course, when they finally, the American finally withdrew, the Laos and Vietnam governments took it out on the Hmong. And some Hmong were airlifted to America, but of course, most stayed, stayed behind and they faced genocide there. Um, and maybe the same might have happened in Nicaragua. I know it's been said the Mosquito Indians there, that in a way, Stalin and Mao, they also both imposed industrialization, like Mao's Great Leap Forward and, and Stalin's <clears throat> similar thing before that, but they also imposed this uniformity that they were not very tolerant of the idea that indigenous people may have their own well, Marx calls it primitive communism, and in some ways, the tribal people are very democratic. Right at independence, there was an exchange between Jaipal Singh Munda and Nehru, where Nehru was saying, we must bring democracy to the tribal areas. And Jaipal Singh was saying, what do you mean? You, what do you mean by democracy? Tribal people are the most democratic people on earth. You have to learn democratic ways from them. So. This is very similar to how, in a way, the Kurdish um, movement has progressed beyond a kind of strict orthodox Mar um, Marxist-Leninism or, or Stalinism or Maoism to, to understand and question a bit that imposed industrialization and imposed uniformity. Or in India, the Marxist parties are quite... Um, uh, orthodox about considering industrialization or even capitalism as a necessary stage of human development or social development. So um, in a lot of these struggles against imposed industrialization that are happening all over India, Marxists are sometimes supporting, but sometimes not. And Maoists are often supporting, but when Maoists support uh, movements against industrialization, it may give the movements strength for a short time but then it's like a kiss of death because it guarantees the security forces are going to come in and the Maoists never question mining in itself or industrialization in itself mm. um well india has a tradition somebody called lohia who was a very strong socialist but he questioned the industrialization as nehru was in, imposing it so I'm, I'm giving you everything from an indian point of view but to carry on with other other countries, you've got, say, in Australia and New Zealand, a similar uniformity being imposed. And then mm -hmm. the Maori more and more strongly have really formulated their own education system. And you've got, say, in Indonesia, you've got as, as, as bad as any country, like especially if you look at West, Western New Guinea, Irian Jaya, just off, the, I mean, You've got some of the world's worst mining companies supported by state security forces who are suppressing an indigenous movement. And just north of um, Irinja, you've got an island where Elon Musk is developing on a little island a satellite station. So you can imagine that the link between global capitalism and, and what's being imposed. So as I say, some of the most interesting experiments in um, questioning this uniformity of education imposed on indigenous peoples is in Ecuador. So that would be another topic for you. But ma many of the Latin American countries who have struggled with extractivism for a long time are rediscovering this kind of self-determination in education too. Mm. And from here, uh, I want to uh move a bit more generally if we can it's it's been a theme of course running throughout our discussion this far but if you could talk a bit about what in your view is the importance of of education for society and for the continuation of a culture and and in that vein uh talk about the relationship between self-determination and education or, or really the significance uh, of a society being able to develop and manage its own education such important questions, yeah, because as I was saying, and until I 
until five years ago, I wasn't looking specifically at education. And now that I'm looking on it, I really see how, like, you know, the sociologist Pierre Bordeaux talks about how education tends to reproduce class structure. But even more than that, it's looking at phenomenon like KISS, you can just see in that, in that photograph, the kind of um, ideology that's being mm -hmm. imposed there, an ideology that is both Hindutva and mm -hmm. promoting industrialization. Yeah, you can see it's almost militarized from the picture. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the alternative models. And there's, there's many in India, but they're still quite small scale. So the one that I personally know best and have been most moved by is called Muskan. And this is just a photograph of um, their school, where for a start, the, the class is happening in a circle, not in the binary that we're used to of a teacher at the front telling the children what to think or what they should learn. And so one of the things they use Paulo Freire's um, mm -hmm critical pedagogy there, where children are really taught to question and taught to bring their own, encouraged to bring their own experience. So one of the things they do there is, Muskan is in the city of Bhopal, right in the middle of India. Um, and the main children in it belong to two scheduled tribes who are, one is the Gons, the same Gons who had the, the Gotul. And is maybe there are at least 3 million Gondi speakers in India. And the other is called Pardi. And Pardi were a hunting tribe who had no tradition of cultivation. And from being hunters, when hunting was outlawed, they became urban waste pickers, rag pickers. I mean, really at the absolute bottom of the pile because the British classified them as a criminal tribe. And this classification, it's, it's something even beyond what we call like the scheduled tribes, the scheduled caste, untouchability. The criminal tribes at independence were called denotified, denotified tribes or DNTs, but the police still considered them habitual congenital criminals. So they actually use members of the criminal tribes to carry out Ill illegal activities like could be theft, very often making of illegal alcohol or something like that. So that's one direction, well, two directions where the parties, they have open to them often a life of crime. And then the police use them whenever the, the police want a bribe, they will go to a family and threaten the family with jail unless they give a bribe. Or the waste reprocessing, and they've become expert reprocessors of waste in, in, uh, in cities. But the other thing, because they're expert hunters, one of the crimes that they're famous for is they became expert tiger hunters working with the tiger hunt, tiger mafia that was hunting mafia. So there are quite a few very expert tiger hunting parties in jail. So what this school is doing is make, making them also proud of their heritage of hunting and the link with the forest, but learning about them and and actually teaching their party language, which is like the lowest, considered the gutter language, of, but being proud of it and teaching it to the other children and the teacher. So children in this Paulo Freire uh, tradition are actually teaching that their teachers the language. And I've, I've had such moving occasions where I've seen a young party or young Gondi teacher from this school really begin to speak their language with pride in public and it i can't tell you how how moving that is um mm. so in in india as a whole like you've got um this is another a book by gladson you've got this um immense violence of the invasion of of tribal um spaces by men in uniform and you've got institutionalized like what they call encounter killings or staged or false encounters where this is a book where, uh, unlike you could never publish a book like this in Turkey, this is a senior policeman anonymously has talking about the body count and how police buy people to kill them in staged encounters um, with Maoists or with, with other so-called insurgents. Um, 
while, while at the kind of broader level, uh, the the impact of capitalism that um, is happening all around us. It's like this is this is my third book, and this is about the people leaf. This is a like if you see Buddhism, you see this shape of leaf. It's very because Buddha became in, enlightened under this leaf, under this tree. So you've got one half of it that's like nature, and one half of it's like money. So it's quite a brilliant. And you've got mm. ecology, economy, that um, the traditional economy is based on ecological principles. And this is, in, in this book, we coined the term Adivasi economics. Mm. So the traditional tribal economy is based on a really thorough understanding of the ecology. And if you go back to Aristotle, you know, the economy of the nation state was meant to be correct use of resources. There's that, that shared root in Greek, oikos, which is the home. Yeah. Exactly. So th this shows like what we still can learn or need to learn maybe from tribal people by in some sense reversing the, the normal direction of learning that we consider them illiterate or backwards. And, you know, may maybe there are things they need to learn from, quote, us. But there's so much more actually we need to learn from them, which is about how to live sustainably, how to really live democratically, which means mm. making decisions in a circle where every voice is heard. It's not a vote where like somebody gets 51 percent, somebody gets 49 percent. So this this concept of competition, for example, the mining companies are sponsoring sport in a big way mm. and sport is all about competition. Well, the traditional Adivasi sport is dancing, mm. which is there is competition going there. Maybe the young men and women are competing over each other who can dance better. But there's no there's no winner and loser. And the same in law, like the process of the traditional tribal culture is to effect a reconciliation between the conflicted parties. So every, when when you have a traditional legal case in a tribal village that's in their hands, in their self-determination. You have both parties maybe shouting and screaming at each other, but then the whole purpose is to bring them together. And finally, the, the elders deciding will maybe find both sides, some maybe more than the other, but that money, or it will often be in produce, rice and vegetable or meat, that would be pay for a feast of reconciliation. Mm. I mean, in a sense, what, what can be more civilised than that? Well, we all think of as normal now the Roman system of law, which is competitive. And it often, in practice, depends who can pay the lawyers more, mm -hmm. uh, that, who is um, demonstrated as right and wrong. So um, in all of these ways, the, the, the importance of kind of not keeping these cultures alive in some artificial way, like in a museum, but quite the opposite. It's actually when we begin to undo the hierarchies that are so they're intrinsic in Indian society as they're intrinsic in European society or Kurdish society or Turkish society. But when we begin to um, find a real democracy and self-determination in matters of what we consider as knowledge also. And that's why I started out by talking about my teacher in Delhi University who really taught me to question Western models of knowledge. Hmm. Thank you. I think as, as we have seen, this, this issue of education is, is really deeply linked to, to every other issue at a, at a very important uh, level. And of course, we could continue talking about it very long, but I think unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank uh, you so much, Colonel. I, I wanted to end by just one yes, very please. positive note, which is... Please, please. Um, this is an article about news that happened just last week when mm. some very close friends of mine called Devangana and Natasha, they had been jailed for over a year mm. in, a, in a very distorted um, case. And they are basically, they are fighting for an equality of rights, whether you're Muslim, Christian, Hindu, atheist, communist, um, but also for women's and girls' rights. So when they were released from jail, and, and of course also they 
they know about the Kurdish struggle. These women themselves are inspired by what's happened in Rojava. Mm -hmm. So this is where both the Kurdish situation can learn from the Indian and the Indian from the Kurdish. I, um, mm -hmm. And we need to know more what's going on in, in mm -hmm. different places where there are struggles against this kind of crazy capitalism mm -hmm. that is dominating our lives right now. Mm -hmm. So thank in, you, Connor. In true free Aryan spirit, the exchange. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.